Hi, I'm Matt. We have Pastor Jeff from our Gosport congregation with us this Sunday, sharing about how faith operates in our everyday life. Let's take a look. Okay, not a lot of pressure then. Pastor Andy's been preaching an amazing word over the last few weeks, so uh, um, I've come just to share very simply with you. If anybody here, if you've been, if you've been going through a test, a trial, difficult time in your life, if you're going through a valley experience, if you're through, in the midst of a battle, then I trust that the Word of God in your life will just really sit well with you. Uh, for those that are on the live stream, for those that are here, you know, this is a word I believe is for you. And if you're not going through a battle, if you're not enduring anything, if you're not going through uh, anything in your world, if, if everything's great on the mountain top of your life, fantastic. But at some point, you may just come down that mountain a little bit. And something suddenly will enter your world. And we know we need to know what to do in the midst of our battle. And it's not a case of jumping in in the midst of our battle and, and, and hoping that we've got the tools to be able to overcome. It's a case of knowing we have the tools before we enter a battle. Anyone agree? Yeah. You don't want to go running out there thinking, okay, where's my sword? And you've left it behind. Where's my shield? And, and, and it's, it's nowhere to be seen. We need to be battle ready in our journey. And if we're not battle ready... Uh, we need to be because battles suddenly come out of the blue, just like storms. You know, you, you don't always have a, a, a well, weathermen these days you still don't know when storms are coming. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, there's a storm. And life can be just like that. So this morning, as I share some thoughts with you, I just want you to embrace it, to, to allow it to go down into your heart and allow God through the power of his spirit, to, to lead you and de develop a battle-ready heart in your life. So here we go. You ready? Okay, some people are ready. Some people, this is the first time you've seen me speak, so just be ready because I've got a lot to say in a very short space of time to say it. No matter lo how long you've been saved, no matter what your journey of Christianity looks like, you have an enemy called the devil who's out there to, to steal to kill and to destroy. That is what his life mission is all about. It's about ruining your journey, tripping you up, bringing a temptation that will cause you to fall flat on your face. He is out there to destroy your life. And very often we don't talk about what else is out there. We talk about the goodness of God. We talk about the power of God. We talk about the miracles of God. But actually, in the journey of our life, there is one who's always going to be out there to try and cause you to fall in your journey of Christianity. And if we're not aware of the wiles of the enemy, then we will fall prey to his devices. It's really important that we're aware. And I love the fact that throughout the Bible, we see men and women who are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. They are strong in their walk with God. There are others who are weak and feeble, but God brings them through. They think they're weak and feeble, but God brings them through. Gideon was a man who was weak and feeble, hiding in a wine press. Yet God said, mighty man, come forth. You'll do something great for me. And, and we can look at our life and we can think we are weak, feeble. We, we don't amount to much. We, we've done too many things wrong in our life. We've made too many mistakes. We've let too many people down. But God's still calling us closer. He's calling us deeper in our walk with him. And, and David was a man who had he had seen many things happen in his life. He was a man. The Bible said he's a man after God's own heart. I don't know about you, but I, I want to be known as a man after God's own heart. I want to be known as a person who, is, who knows their God, who can do great things for our God. And even from a young man when he was out in the, out in the fields looking after the sheep, he was a man who knew his God. And when the bear or when the lion came along to steal the, the sheep that he was looking after, he took hold of his, his slingshot and he said, that's, that's my dad's and you're not taking it from him. And out he would go and kill the bear and the lion and it was all the preparation. Do you know what? So much of our life is about preparation. If we're not preparing ourselves, if we're not preparing our life, we will never know what, what, what comes next, whether we've got the tools in our life to overcome. Because the next thing that came along in David's life was Goliath. The next thing that came in, along in his life was the defeat to the Jewish nation or victory over, their, over the Philistines. And in that battle, David started to declare the things that were true to his heart. 
And very often the things that are true to our heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth begins to speak. There was something that David had put into his life way before the battle with David and Goliath, way before the situation that happened with Bathsheba, way before there was things that he put in his heart. And this morning is about us preparing our heart. Are we ready in our life? And David penned this incredible psalm, Psalm 63, verse 1 to 3. And he declares, this is a real declaration. Oh God, you are my God. What a great declaration. If every one of us in, in, in the circumstances of our life, we were able to declare, God, my God, you are the living God. What a great place to start in the midst of any battle. What a great place to start first thing on a Monday morning. Oh God, you are God. You are in control. And then he goes on, he says, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And we live in a world where if you're not watering your life, if you're not allowing God to water your life, we're in a dry and thirsty land. You may be here today and your Christian experience feels like you're in a dry and thirsty land. But the truth is, David was able to cry out to God, my soul, the inner part of who I am, my inner man, it thirsts for you. But I know that you are the source of nourishment. I know that you are, when, when I walk with you, when I walk closely with you, you are the source to my life. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. What a great declaration. As he begins to declare, God, you are this, you are that, you are the other. Very often, what do we do? We declare the circumstances, the problem, the issues. And we, be, we, we, we speak up the problems that are in our life so they become the mountains rather than God being the mountain and the issue being the molehill. It's so important that we big God up. God doesn't need to be bigged up, but he, he's already bigged up. But in your life, my life, we need to big him up. David's not talking to his spirit. He's talking to his soul. And there's another scripture in, in, in the Psalms, and David is saying, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Hope in God. And he's, it's like he changed his focus. He was going down this route. He was going down this line of, of negativity, and, and everything's wo woe in my life. And then he takes himself by the scruff of the neck and says, no, what am I doing? Let's get back on track and begin to declare God's amazing grace over my life. Which of those two scenarios really pinpoints your life this morning? Are you a woe is me or are you my God can do anything? And depending where we are in that will depend how, how very often the circumstances of our life will outwork in our journey. Why? Because we live in a, a fast-paced world. We live with busy schedules. We live running around from one thing to another. And yet the key for many of us is to stand still and know that he is God. David had these moments when he got out his harp or whatever instrument that he had, and he began to make melody before God. What was that? He was taking time out to be still in the presence of God. And I love what Psalm 46 says. It says, be still. That be still means to be quiet in God's presence. Oh, you can't do that when you're running around uh, uh, looking after all these different things and, and getting involved with so many areas. And sometimes we just need to say, I need to be still. For the well-being of my soul, I need to be still. That word to be still means to cease from our striving. I wonder how many of us are, are doers and we're always trying to do something else. We're trying to do some more. We're trying, we're trying and trying and trying. And yet God is saying, look, just be still and allow me to do what you can't do. Be still and let me move the mountains that you've been trying to move. Let me break through in the situation that you can't do anything about, but let me just be still and allow me to be God over the circumstances. I believe it's so important that we allow God to be who he is 
rather than us trying to be God of what he's called us to do. To be still and know is to, to know God well enough and to trust in his ability to be an ever-present help in time of need. Is there anybody in need here this morning? Anybody got a need in your life? Wow, not many of you. Okay, oh, there's a few more. There's a few. <laughs> the longer you keep your hand up, the more honest people become. It started with, with one at the back and then everyone joined in. It was great. We all have needs somewhere. You may have a health need. You may have need with your children. You may have a need with, with a, f- a physical issue that you're dealing with in your life. We all have needs, but God said he is an ever-present help in time of need. Whatever your need is, God is an ever-present help. Whatever's going on in your world, he's an ever-present help. But sometimes it's, it's that busyness that keeps us from the one who can do something about it. And we just keep on maintaining and trying to perform and trying to keep that happy smile on our face. But all the time in your heart there's this cry, does anybody care? Does God care? But actually God cares so much that he said, I'm an ever-present help. To call upon me, I will be there for you. Mountains. I don't know, anybody ever climbed a mountain? Yeah, one or two. I, I started climbing a mountain a few years ago. Um, Jane decided that she couldn't make it, so she didn't. Um, and so me and all the boys, and I um, can't remember if Jen was with us as well, we started to climb this mountain, Mount Snowden. It's not exactly the highest mountain in the world, so we got part way up, and um, I turned around and I saw Josh was struggling a little bit to keep up with us. And I'm thinking, come on, son, keep up. And we just kept on going, dragging him higher. And um, he was really beginning to struggle. And I, I said, you're right. He said, I'm just struggling, Dad. I said, I pull yourself together. We'll get a bit higher to go. And off we went a bit higher. He starts having an asthma attack on the middle of the Snowden. He, hadn't, he had an inhaler that was empty like children do. And, and he's struggling to breathe in the middle of this mountain. It's like, okay, let's pray. Because there's, there's no way of getting up higher or down lower without an issue happening. So we just stood there in the midst of the mountain and prayed for him. But you know what? We can be in the midst of a mountain situation. And we're beginning to struggle. And it's... <gasps> and you know what that feels like on the inside of you. When you're struggling to breathe, when you're struggling to cope, when you're struggling to manage in the middle of your mountain. But I want you to take heed. I want you to take courage from this next scripture. Because when, as I was preparing, as I looked at this scripture, it just so blessed my life. Because many of you think that any of the pastors out here, we never have problems. We never have mountains. We never have issues. Well, we do. <laughs> Welcome to our world. We do. We have a few. A few just that continue to go. A few that happen from time to time. But... We have issues just like you and I, you and everybody else in the room, we have them. But this, this, this passage just so blessed me. And Psalm 97 says this, verse 5. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord, of the whole earth. Not just the, just, not, not just the Lord of, of your issues. All your problem, but the Lord of the whole earth and all their problems. He said, the mountains, they melt like wax. And this morning, your mountain, your mountain can melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. There's a key really here in this scripture that I think is just so, so important. Because the mountains melt like wax. The, you, know, you may be speaking to it. You may be speaking by faith. You may be declaring But it says, they melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. We've got to bring the presence of God into our life. We've got to bring the presence of God into our situations. I've just got a few areas that really could be mountains in your life. And I just want to speak these out because you may say, yeah, that's my mountain. That's where I'm struggling. A mountain of debt and lack. A mountain of past issues and past hurts, a mountain of sickness. You know, I look at our congregation in Gosport, 
And those that are connected to our congregation over there, we're dealing with five at the moment that are struggling with life and death, cancerous situations. You may be here and you receive bad news this week or someone in your family received bad news. That's a mountain. A mountain of failure. It seems like everything you put your hand to, it doesn't turn to gold. It, it crashes like ashes. That could be your mountain of failure. A mountain of regret. The, you wish you'd married the other person. No, don't. You married them now. God can turn all things around for the good of those who love him. God can turn a difficult marriage into one that's a blessing. God can turn a difficult family situation around so that it becomes a blessing. But these are mountains. A mountain of regret. I wish I hadn't gone and got that job. I wish I had another job. I wish, I wish, I wish. But we can't live by the wishes and the hopes of our past. We've got to live by the purposes of God in our generation. We've got to allow God to fill us and be our all in all. A mountain of pain. A mountain of pain. That thing that perhaps you can't even describe in your life, you can't express to other people, you can't even articulate it yourself, but God, God knows that mountain of pain that's in your life. And he knows how to remove that pain, how to remove that root that's taken place in your life. He's able to remove it and cause it to melt like wax, like a mountain in his hand, to melt in your life. And I believe that I'm talking to many people in this room. You say, yeah, that's me, and, and I identify with that, and that's right where I am. And others in the room, you say, my, my mountain's a mountain of sin. If you knew what I was doing, if you knew where I was going, if you knew my, my world outside these four walls, we all have mountains. But the key is this, the mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is the key. Are you walking with him like Adam did in the cool of the day? Enoch walked with God. Abraham walked with I love the fact that there are at least three men in the Old Testament. And the Bible says that they walked with God. Can I challenge you this morning? Where is your walk with God? What does your walk with God look like? Oh, we can preach wonderful sermons and get you fired up, stirred up, and you may jump and celebrate and get all excited in here, but it's what happens outside these four walls, what happens tomorrow morning, what happens during the week. It's your walk with God that matters most. Yeah. Not your experience here on a Sunday and how good it feels and how beautiful it is. It's your everyday walk with him. There's a couple of other guys I want to talk about who walked with God in the New Testament. Jesus, the Bible says Jesus came alongside two men. You know, he had just been crucified, he had been put into the, into the grave and he has risen from the dead. And then two disciples are walking to Emmaus. And Jesus comes alongside and he begins to walk with them. They don't recognize him. They can't identify with him. They don't get him. You know, he turns around and says, why are you so downcast? Oh, the one who we worship, the one who we thought was going to be, he's, he, he died. They, they didn't get him. I want to read this because it's always a passage that's intrigued me. In Luke 24, verse 28 to 32, it says, Then they drew near to the village where they were going. And Jesus, it says, he indicated that he would have gone further. I love this. You know, in, in different situations, when, when the disciples were out in the midst of their storm, it was then that Jesus was going to walk past. Because Jesus sees stuff that's going on in our world, but he won't respond until faith is released. He won't respond until we connect with him. We begin to walk with him as we all. And we cry out to him in the midst of our situation. And in the midst of the storm, he cried out and Jesus then went near. Here, he indicated that he was going to go on further. But they constrained him. 
You know, if there was an intruder who ran into the building this morning and, and they constrained him, it's like they, they do rugby tackle, they pile on top of him. I don't know whether they did this to Jesus, but, but whatever they did, they constrained him to stay. Saying, abide with us, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. And when he went in to stay with, and, and he went in to stay with them. And it came to pass that as they sat at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it. I'm so pleased we received communion this morning. Because many of us in the room could have just done communion because it's a religious tradition. Some of us in the room may have done communion because, you know, it's, it's the thing to do. But others in the room, you, you placed faith to what we did this morning. You connected with it. You allowed God to walk through the corridor of your life, highlighting, pinpointing areas of your life and where you could repent, deal with it, and nail it to the cross saying, I'm done with that in my life. Otherwise, it just becomes a religious tradition in church. And here it says um, that, that uh, in verse 30, and it came to pass as he sat at the table, he broke bread and blessed it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Do you know him today? Their eyes were opened. Many, I, I believe there are many Christians throughout our country who are doing the church thing this morning. They're in church. They're connecting with God. They're doing worship. They may even be serving him on teams. But do they know him? I love it when Paul turned around and says, Oh, that I would know you. Oh, that I would walk in fellowship with you. That I would know the power of your suffering and the glory. He, he, he just, his desire was to know Jesus more and more. And here it says, Their eyes were opened and they knew him. That moment in their life changed the destiny forever in their world. Because they suddenly knew him, not just here, but in their heart. And it says, the moment that they knew him, he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, didn't our heart burn within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? I don't know what happens to you when you open the word of God. But does it come alive or is it... I've read that before. Uh, let me find something that's of interest. Because when you know him, the author of the book, the book suddenly comes alive. It becomes a quick and powerful sword, dividing soul, spirit, bone, marrow, the thoughts and the intents of our heart. It becomes his love letter to our life. It becomes his map to our journey. But the key is, are we making room? The disciples didn't identify with him. They couldn't get him. They, did. they knew that their heart was excited walking and talking with him, but they hadn't experienced. They, the light hadn't turned on in their life. But the moment it did, it changed everything. See, God hasn't got favorites. You know, Pastor Stu, I believe, knows God and walks with him. But he's not one of God's favorites. He is a favorite amongst us all. Because Victoria is a favorite, and Graham's a favorite. And, and if I knew all of you, Emmanuel, you're a favorite. And just keep going through the. We're all his favorites. Inscribed, our name inscribed on the palm of his hands, the apple of his eye. That is who you are. But we may not feel it in the midst of our mountains. Or we may not feel it in the face of our giants. Or we may not feel it when we're walking through the valleys. But whether we're in a valley or mountaintop or a giant in front of us, we are still, we are still his favorites. And as I was thinking about this in the week, do we know the Jesus revealed in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Or do we know the resurrected Lord and the King of glory? Who is it that we know? Do we know the, the, the Jesus of the Gospels? Or do we know him as the resurrected king of glory? 
Do we know him as the one who sent the Spirit because he went back to be with his Father? Do we know at a level, do we know at a new level the power of who Jesus is in our life? He turned around and said, look, if I go to be with the Father, I'll give you my name. And whatever you ask in my name, it will be done. Do we know that Jesus who can do mighty things through our life? Clearly, these disciples, they they knew of him, but did they know him? They knew of him. They walked with him for three years. They'd eaten with him. They had slept in the same vicinity as him. They had done life together. They'd seen the miracles. They even saw him die upon a cross. They knew of him. They knew about him. They knew of his life. But do you know what? Many of you know me, but do you really know me? We know of the queen, but do you know if she's her favorite slippers that she's walking around in Buckingham Palace right now today? You don't know her. You know of her. Do we know Jesus or do we just know of him? Do we know, have we got a religious experience where we attend church, but we don't fall on our face in submission and love for him? We don't serve and roll up our sleeves and say, you serve me, you died for me, I'm going to give my all for you. I, I don't know. I don't know. If we knew him like we should know him, in worship we would be bowed down. In, in serving we would be sleeves rolled up. In everything that we do in outreach, we would be out there doing it. If we knew him. Because he is our all in all. Are we walking with him? Do we really know what his presence feels like? I, 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 since the beginning of the year, it's one of the things, the joys of my life, um, around about sort of a half hour, three quarters of an hour before my working day during the day comes to an end and then there's the evening meetings, my working day, I just turn off everything else, all the other distractions, and I begin to worship and pray worship and pray this is my turn with time with you lord this is my turn time to seek you to walk with you to hear from you for you to speak to me i'm gonna worship you if i hear nothing i'll worship for a for an hour and i just love these moments because god's done something in my heart can i encourage you if you finish if you finish at half five and you're driving home don't listen to the news worship him Don't close your eyes, but just worship him as you drive, all right? Just spend time in the presence of the Lord and allow him to minister into your life. Do you know the presence? Do you know the breath of God upon your face? Do you, would you recognize in the midst of the hubble bubble of noise that would go on when we start talking all together, would you recognize his voice in this room? Because you only do that when you begin to know him and the power of his resurrection. Psalm 27 verse 4 says this, One thing I have asked of the Lord, and that will I seek. Let this be our heart, church. Let this be our heart. This one thing, oh, there could be many, but this one thing is what I seek. Inquire for, insistently require, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, in his presence all the days of of my life, to behold and gaze upon the beauty, the sweet attractiveness, and the delightful loveliness of the Lord, and to meditate, consider, and inquire in his temple. What a great scripture, this one thing. Sometimes that one thing is the last thing, but it needs to be the first thing, seeking first the kingdom of God. Let's put him first. Let's make him our priority. In our journey. So how can I experience the presence of God? I've just got a few one-liners for you. Hunger and thirst for it. Create an appetite in your life. Take time to be still. Allow yourself time in your day to allow God to be Lord over your life. Learn to wait upon the Lord. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Learn to wait on him. Approach God with a real expectation in your heart. 
Not, well, he may, be, he may be busy ministering to somebody else's life. No, allow that expectation. God is going to come and minister to me as I spend time with him. Draw near to him. Why? Because he's promised that as we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. God is faithful to his promises. And the last one on this is practice the presence of God daily. Practice the presence of God, allowing him to wash and fill and empower your life. Over this last week, this is one thing that I've been doing, and I just want to share it with you. I've not shared it with anybody else yet. It's about uttering short breath-like prayers. I read it in the week, and, and it just really inspired me. So it's something I've been doing. Breath, because we can be so, we can get so busy in our prayer life that we're, we're talking and talking and talking to God, and we're asking Him our shopping list of issues and things. But I just, when I, when I read this, I thought that so spoke to my heart. Breath prayers go like this Give me a heart for you. Oh, that's so simple, isn't it? But when, when, when you're in the presence of God and you're, just, you're honest, you're being real, Lord, give me, give me a heart. Give me a heart for you, Lord. It suddenly becomes, it takes away the vain babblings and, and perhaps the, the shopping lists of prayer and all of a sudden becomes real. This is about me and you, God. This is about me and, our, me and you and our journey. I want more of you, Jesus. It's just a breath. You can do it in one breath. Save yourself a whole lot of breath in your prayers this week. I want more of you, Jesus. God answers prayers like that. Lord, be my everything. Be my everything. Oh, that could lead into so many other prayers, but... Be disciplined. Lord, be my everything. Jesus, I'm completely yours. Simple, isn't it? It's so simple, yet it's so profound. Because you pray a prayer like that. And God, the presence of God begins to drop. I don't know about you, but I fe- just reading these out, I felt the presence of the Lord dropping in this place right now. I've got a couple of others. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You can pray that prayer over and over again. And then at the end of it, you can turn around and say, I love you, Lord, and this is the reason why. And then the last prayer is this. Captivate my heart, Lord Jesus. Just captivate my heart. Let my gaze be fully on you. Just simple prayers. But I believe they are life-changing prayers. They are breath prayers. Just one simple breath. But that breath can take you to a place that perhaps you've not been for a long time. Jesus is real. And he wants you to experience him in a deeper level. He wants you to know him at a level that you've never been before. Taking you higher, taking you stronger, but also taking you deeper into that relationship with him. And I believe every one of us in this room, deep inside our heart, that's our heartbeat. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that could be the thing that's been missing in your life. And and you try to fill it with so many other things. You try to fill it with other areas of your life. Maybe the business of work. Maybe it's with, with family activities. But actually in your heart of hearts, you know that there's an emptiness and a longing in your heart. And today... I've put my finger on the, on, the, on the button. You know today it's Jesus. Jesus is the answer. He's the one that you've been searching for, longing for, but today you found your answer. I love the fact that family 
church, in all our congregations, give people an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And today we're going to do the same thing because today you may have heard something and you say, yes, that's me. That's the hunger. That's the thirst that I'm feeling. That's the mountain I want to see come down in my life. But Jesus is the key. He died upon a cross, not because he wanted to, because he needed to for your life and for mine. He chose to lay down his life so that we could live for him. Well, I hope you enjoyed that message. Don't forget, you can catch up with all of our messages on our Family Church app or at family.church.